Please open your Bibles to John chapter 6 this morning and be ready to go to John chapter 12, but we'll just read our text and pray, and then we'll move to chapter 12 uh, following that shortly after that. So John chapter 6. <clears throat> I preach a message this morning entitled The Making of a King. The Making of a King. And uh, obviously we understand that Jesus Christ is King. So it wasn't men that were making Him a King, but you do have a choice about whether or not you receive Him as your King. Okay, so let's look at verse 15 of John chapter 6, will you please? When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take Him by force to make Him a King, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, and I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Father, please help us in not only our understanding together, but God in really organizing, sequencing, <clears throat> sequencing the events that led to the cross and the resurrection. Most of all, I pray that you would help us to examine ourselves and to understand the gospel clearly enough that we uh, would be able to preach it so that people would examine themselves on what they have done with Jesus their King. We pray for His sake. Amen. Amen. Well, if you look back to chapter 6, we'll make a couple of comments uh, briefly. Actually, you don't need to look there, but just stay in chapter 6 for a little bit. And I just want to look at this matter of who Jesus Christ is. Of course, this is Palm Sunday, which we celebrate. And I believe it's accurate to celebrate Palm Sunday today. There are a lot of naysayers today that have a real problem with the schedule of what Christians and what the church believes regarding the birth of Jesus Christ in December. And Jesus absolutely was born between the end of December and January in spite of naysayers and the arguments based on the sheep in Bethlehem. Uh, there would be a number of reasons why what the Scripture teaches about it. For instance, here is what people would say, well, it's too cold in Bethlehem for the shepherds to be keeping their flocks by night. Well, first of all, the sheep would not be anywhere around Bethlehem unless it were December. They would be out further away. They wouldn't be keeping, they wouldn't be keeping close to Bethlehem. And the other assumption is that, you know, it's just always cold, so cold that the sheep are penned up for the entire winter. And anyone who's kept sheep, no, you don't keep it penned up for the entire winter. And so evidently the night that the shepherds were told that Christ was born, evidently it wasn't so terribly cold that night because they were out uh, on the hills outside of Bethlehem keeping their flocks by night, but they were near enough proximity that they could go and see the Savior that evening. But there are a lot of, a lot of believers who have bought into the attack on the date of Christmas. And friend, it's an attack. It's an attack that tries to teach that the Scripture contradicts itself. That's the underlying argument behind people that attack the celebration of Christmas. And they try to take the word Christ and Mass and the fact that Mass means celebration and, and, and make it a Catholic thing. It's not a Catholic thing. Jesus Christ came, my friend. He was born. And if you think that there is a more significant event in time than the birth of Jesus Christ or that it should not be celebrated, you haven't thought it through very well. Is all I could say. I don't want to insult you. But you've bought into an argument by people who are trying, that has been developed by people who are trying to undermine the Scripture and trying to come up with contradictions in the Scripture. And the underlying argument isn't that Jesus wasn't born at Christmas time. The underlying argument is that the Bible has errors in it. That's the underlying argument, and that's what you bought hook, line, and sinker if you go that direction with it. Be a thinking believer, be, be a thinker. And uh, I could just give you, if you'd like, a little bit of information. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, really it's a good book that has good sources in it to do an honest study. I would recommend for you the uh, Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Honer. Don't completely endorse the book, but it does an excellent job of looking at varied views and then debunking a lot of myths about the timeline of Jesus Christ 
and ultimately it brings us to where we actually know the exact date uh, when Jesus Christ was crucified and the exact date when Jesus Christ rose again. So for the people that are naysayers about the Friday, uh, the Friday or Good Friday being the crucifixion evening, and they, they don't understand the differences between calendars and so forth. It would be a real help to you. And rather than just buy into somebody's argument and attack the scriptures, I would encourage you to study and read and come up with some answers for some things. And so that'd be that'd be a help for you. That's not the message this morning. That's introductory or that's uh, ancillary, if you will. It doesn't have so much to do with it. But I do want to say that we uh, celebrate uh, we we celebrate Palm Sunday, and we celebrate Resurrection Sunday every single year. And we're not in doubt about the resurrection. We're not in doubt about those events. And just because Catholics are right about some things doesn't mean that we have to knee-jerk and just not believe something because, you know, there's a lot of truth in Catholicism. There, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be effective if, there weren't a, if it wasn't mixed with a lot of truth. There are things that are definitely major errors, important doctrinal errors. But uh, there is a wholesale hijacking of uh, Christianity. And to hijack something, you have to, you have to take a lot of the real thing and then add your things to it, like adding the saints, which represent idols, and adding the worship of Mary, which represents Diana, and so forth, to, to develop something that's truth into a religion. It has to be somewhat believable, doesn't it, in order to deceive people. And so uh, we as believers need to be wise. We need to study the Scripture. We need to look at things, ask questions, but not just buy into the first argument that attacks or undermines your faith. We need to think about those things. Okay. Well, last week we were in John chapter 6, and we ultimately concluded with the time that people, many believed, the Bible said in John chapter 6 and, uh, and uh, verse 64, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, said, There are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And then in verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And this is when Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? What was their answer? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we are faced with the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus is the only Savior. Religion is men being willing to settle or willing to tell themselves that they, what they are doing or what they have is valid enough that they can kind of snowball God about it. You ever had an employee working for you or you ever had a child that you just weren't sure if they didn't actually understand you ever just dealt with somebody you think I think they know better but I'm not sure you know and so it's kind of hard to yell at them because they really might be that dumb <laughs> I mean you, you, you might be that that ignorant I, you can't yell at somebody just because they're lacking up here you know what I mean what God gave them isn't their fault and so sometimes I don't know. I, I put it not more nicely than that usually when I deal with people. But sometimes I think, you know what, they might be that ignorant. So it wouldn't be fair for me to get angry with them or correct them in a way like they deliberately did something wrong. But you know, when it comes to believing in Jesus, a lot of people think that they're going to be able to kind of throw the religion thing. I was sincere in my religion thing at God. And God will be like, well, you really believed it so... Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you're playing the game of, I'm going to be as sincere with the wrong thing as I can, and I'm going to refuse to receive Jesus instead of. By the way, it's Jesus instead of religion. It's Jesus instead of anything else. But instead of Jesus, you're going to have the everything else or the anything else. And based on how sincere or how much you wanted to practice that religion, then your rebellion, God will excuse because, you know, He can't quite tell if you really were that dumb. Now that's pastor's way of putting it. Uh, God will be much worse than pastor. Uh, God gave us His Son. Think on this. God gave us His perfect Son to die for sin. And if you receive to receive, or you, I mean, so you refuse to receive the free gift of eternal life, there's not going to be any, oh well, I know I made a great sacrifice and you wasted it with God. Think on that. 
meditate on that. Okay, so we saw that last week. This week, we find ourselves kind of going back a little bit to a story we overlooked <coughs> somewhat, and that was Jesus walking on water, and that isn't the point for today, but I want to begin uh, really to look at what people wanted to do with Jesus. In particular, we're talking about the making of a king. When Jesus came as the Messiah, the people of the day wanted to make him their king. And matter of fact, I, I wouldn't use the phrase myself. I'd say, well, you can't make Jesus a king. <coughs> he is king. We all agree on that? Okay, you can't make Jesus king. But actually, that's precisely what they wanted to do. And when we see the phrase, make him their king, in verse uh, 15, look at it. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself, alone. Any man but Jesus would be fine with what the people wanted to do. Right? Any man but Jesus would be fine with being made a king. But the problem was they were trying to make him a king that wasn't what he came to do. Now we know what they wanted. They wanted to uh, be free. Really, not so much from the Roman Empire but probably from the taxation of the Roman Empire, from the burden that the Romans would put on them as lesser citizens. If you were Jewish, a Jewish citizen, you weren't a Roman citizen, and so you were less of a person. We don't have, we don't have it in our country. There are people who say, you know, they, you know, everybody's not equal in our country. Well, first of all, God doesn't make people equal. Not everyone possesses the same intelligence. Not everyone possesses the same background, the same abilities, or even the unique circumstances which are opportunities in their lives. There are no equal people in any circumstance. Today, if we spent enough time exploring, we could find areas where you're superior to probably every other person in this room in some aspect or some avenue. And we could also find ways where each of us are superior to someone else, or inferior to someone else as well. You understand what I'm saying by that? And so the whole idea of equality, we don't understand because we're American, and, and I'm glad for that, to be frank. But I tell people that are anti-American sometimes, go somewhere. Go to another country somewhere. In a couple of weeks, my wife and I are going to Turkey, and we're going during Ramadan, actually, which is not when I would schedule to go to Turkey. Uh, normally, but we're going on a, a missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. So we're going to go to Turkey and we're going to go to Greek. My wife is not looking forward to being in Turkey during Ramadan, to be quite frank with you. She, matter of fact, is kind of making me feel badly because she's really going because I want to go. And I hope nothing bad happens to her when we go to Turkey because I feel terrible about it. The reality of it is I don't really worry. The things like that don't concern me as much as maybe they should. Uh, but they do. She does think about those things, and she's researching right now. Turkey is on a um, is try to go somewhere else list. It's not like that. You can't go to the country, but see if you can go somewhere else instead. Is what the travel warning for Turkey is right now. And she, I wish she wouldn't research things and check things out like this. It'd be better just not to know that, right? Well, the fact is, try to go to Turkey and act like you do in America sometime. Try to go to Turkey and expect to be able to do whatever you want to, and, and if somebody opposes you, give them an earful. You won't come back. And it's that way in a lot of places in the world. And the reality of it is, is if you want to relate to what the people, the Hebrews, the, the Israelites were dealing with under the Roman Empire, you know, any Jewish man can be compelled. You know what being compelled is, don't you? A Roman soldier's got his pack and he's walking by and you're busy in the market working or you're in your field working and he could say, carry my pack for me. What is it, for a mile or a furlong or whatever it was? Carry, carry my pack for me. And it didn't matter what you were doing. You didn't say, well, let me lock up first or let me whatever. He said, now, carry my pack and let's go. And if you didn't do it, that's it. You're dead. That was the law. You weren't an equal. You could be compelled. And so... The circumstances, if you can imagine the taxation and the citizenship, those issues were problems that made it so that Jewish subjects were not happy to be under the thumb of Caesar. Does that make sense? 
So when they wanted to make Jesus their king, they're not saying, oh, the Messiah has come, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And through Him we're going to be given eternal life. They're saying, you know what? A guy that can do anything could make Rome disappear. That's what they're thinking. And so when the Scripture says that Jesus knew after He had made bread and taken up 12 baskets of the fragments after feeding 5,000, when Jesus knew that they would come and make Him their King, Jesus wasn't going to be their kind of King. Listen to me here today. In churches, in religion, people are making Jesus, quote, their King, or making Jesus their Savior, but they're trying to make Him something that He is not. See, if you make Jesus your King, what you have done is you have made yourself His subject. They're not interested in, in serving the king. They're interested in the king accomplishing their purpose. A lot of believers aren't interested in serving Jesus either. They're interested in taking care of a need they have. I thank God for problems that God puts in people's lives that makes them look heavenward. This last week I spent a good bit of time with people who normally would not be seeking God, but God put problems in their life to make them look heavenward. And I thank God for that, that He does that. But I'm not so naive and unaware as to think that if a man has trouble with his wife and, and literally he's about to lose her and he calls pastor for help, I'm not so naive as to think that all of a sudden his spiritual priorities have aligned. He's got a problem and he wants his problem to go away. Man's uh, court-ordered into counseling because of something that he's done and the court is going to take into consideration the fact that he sought biblical counseling and he's gone to church. I'm not... Listen, God will use those circumstances. You get under the preaching of the Word of God where the power of the Holy Spirit of God is. I don't care what your motive is. God will get you. But I'm not naive as to the motive of a person who would seek counseling or start attending church. He wants pastor to go to court with him and sit down beside him when he stands up before the judge. He wants to be seen with a preacher. You understand what I'm saying? And when we look at making Jesus our King, we're not talking about they want to be subject to the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're talking about they want a King who will do their bidding. And they know that He can do anything. <clears throat> They've seen the things that Jesus did, and the reason Jesus did miracles was why? To show who He was. To prove He's God. And they saw that He was God and they thought, boy, we could really get God to do some stuff instead of we need God. And so Jesus hid Himself from them. He crossed over. And that's last week when we saw they came and said, you know, Master, whence camest thou? How'd you get here? And Jesus said, you seek Me not because, not because you want Me. You're seeking Me because you ate of the bread and were filled. And you need to seek, Jesus said, you need to seek eternal bread not physical bread. You need to seek spiritual bread, not physical bread. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the living bread. And that's what they needed. And then they, they remember they went off onto their second question of, well, you know, what good work do we do? You know, and, and all of these are dishonest questions. And what I want us to understand as you turn to chapter 12 now is that individuals that look at Jesus, that seek Him as their King, it, not everything that appears meets the eye. Not everything that it seems to be is what it ought to be. You understand what our premise is this morning? Not everyone who, quote, wants Jesus to be king wants Him to be their son. Are they playing basketball out there again? Okay, good. All right, you guys keep it. If they, if they play basketball, Jamancy, you go grab them and bring them in. Okay? Thank you. All right. You never know. Somebody park under the basketball hoop next week, will you please? Do us the favor. Uh, <laughs> park under the hoop. All right. Um, you're in chapter 12, and uh, we're, we're going to look at a couple of things. This is the triumphal entry. Let, let's, just, let's just look at the triumphal entry of the Savior. And in verse, let's just start in verse 10 because we're talking about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And verse 9. Much of the people, of much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. And so now Lazarus is a celebrity. He'd been in the grave for 
four years, I'm talking about four years. <laughs> He'd been in the grave. That's how long that phone was ringing. <laughs> He'd been in the grave for four days. And after being in the grave uh, for four days, everybody knew he was dead. They knew that the way he was bound up, wrapped up in the napkin, that if a man were alive, he'd have suffocated in that amount of time. Just the burial procedure, the process of preparing his body for burial, he'd have been dead even if he'd been buried alive. So he'd been dead for four days, and Jesus cried, Lazarus, come forth. And they said, you know, he's, he stinketh. He's, by now he's rotting. You don't want him to come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave, and now he's a celebrity because he was raised from the dead. Something happened to him, and everybody wants to see the guy that was raised from the dead. I would too. If he were in a carnival booth, I'd pay 50 cents to see him. Okay, so Lazarus is the celebrity. People, a lot of people heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And on that to be a little bit of clue about life and about Jesus and what he could accomplish that he was able to raise the dead. Uh, obviously, we know the picture, don't we, that we are spiritually dead and that the giver of life, the one who could forgive sins, could give us life. And so it was an attraction. In verse 10, the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Now this is one that I, the, the phrase and the notion of my meditating on it makes me chuckle. And it makes me laugh to think that people thought that a man that Jesus had raised from the dead couldn't be raised again. You ever think about that? Okay, put Lazarus to death. You know, rough him up a little bit. Make it, make it terrible. Dismember him, whatever. <laughs> and Jesus brings him back. I believe, this is just a notion that I have, and it may be true, may not be true, but I believe that the reason that it was so long after the day of Pentecost before the first Christian was put to death, I believe that the reason for that was because they had a healthy fear of putting people to death and the impact of the resurrection. Because they crucified Jesus, and after three days, God raised Him from, a, from the dead. They thought they were going to get rid of the king. They thought they were going to put away the problem of someone who supplanted false kings, the Herod and even, uh, even Caesar. They thought putting him to death was going to take care of a problem that they had, and then He rose from the dead, and they had a much bigger problem. And now, everyone who believes in Jesus has eternal life. If you study the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians, the letter written to them, you'll see that the question they had, you don't need to turn there, I'm just, I'm just explaining. Uh, you'll, you'll see one of the questions the church at Thessalonica had is, what is going on with believers dying? I thought believers didn't die. I thought they were, had eternal life. They were resurrected. Well, their bodies died, but their souls, their spiritual birth, they were eternal. So they, they, were, they couldn't die. Same as you. you. Your body may go into the ground, but you'll never die. You are eternal. You will not become eternal. You are eternal if you've received Jesus as your Savior. God gave you eternal life. Well, they had doubts about this, the early church did. They said, well, you know, if we have eternal life, are we ever physically going to die? Secondly, they all thought that they were going to live until the coming of Jesus to take up His saints. Not the second coming where He comes to judge the wicked, but when Jesus comes in the sky and calls up the saints. And all the believers thought they were going to live until that time. And so they were really, really troubled and shaken in their faith when physical death happened to some people. And their natural question was, maybe that person wasn't really a believer because they physically died. Maybe they didn't really believe in Jesus because they shouldn't have died. They didn't think anyone had died. Since then, they've all died. But we know that the resurrection and the raising of Lazarus were indisputable facts. They were events that occurred that no one could deny. So the chief priest's plan is, you know, this guy Lazarus is popular and he's pointing to Jesus uh, in his popularity. Jesus is becoming popular as well, and so we better put him to death. We better kill him again. Good luck with that one, is what I say. You can't kill a man that Jesus can raise from the dead, even if you want to. Well, that isn't what happened, but verse 12 takes us to Palm Sunday. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, stop. Do you remember in chapter 6 what the people wanted to do with Jesus? They wanted to make Him their king. Well, now they know where He is and they know where He's going. And what would be the seat of the king? Jerusalem, Jerusalem would be. So they hear Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel! 
that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. Now, how many people were that? Well, it's a multitude of people. Why does John mention this? Why does John say something like the people that witnessed Lazarus being raised from the dead bear record? Now, what does it mean to bear record? Well, record can be a record can be two ways. It can be verbal, and it also can be written. And there is a lot of written records of not only the miracles that Jesus did, but of the resurrection. There, keep in mind, friend, if you if you meet people that because they just believe and they haven't studied, because they of that they say things like, "We don't." You ever heard somebody say this? We don't even know if Jesus ever existed. I heard people say that. Well, evidently you haven't looked for evidence of Jesus' existence. There's a bit of contemporary evidence of Jesus existing every Sunday when the body gets together. Is the impact of a non-existent person to turn the world upside down is a little bit of something that would make me a little ludicrous or having a hard time believing a person never existed. Many individuals, though, have set out to disprove either the existence of Jesus Christ or to disprove the things that Jesus did that prove that He was God, that is, the miracles. And when they were honest with the facts, when they saw all the overwhelming evidence of Jesus and the miracles He did, the people that bear record of what Jesus did, they said, you know, it's just too overwhelming. And their conclusion was, Jesus not only existed, but He was also the Son of God. And so they became believers. Many individuals, perhaps some of you, have become believers because you've examined the evidence. And so that's what's significant about John saying this. Again, it fits with our theme in John. Do you see it? What's the theme of John? These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. And so again, John's perspective of Palm Sunday is not so much of, you know, the miracle of loosing the young colt and the man saying, what are you doing on loosing the colt? And he, they said, the master hath need of him. No, John's perspective is many people bear record. Do you see this? It fits the theme that these things are written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, this is for us, folks. This is real. This is as real as it gets. Many bear record of Lazarus' resurrection. Many bear record of Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem and fulfilling the prophecy that the king is going to come from Zion sitting on an ass's colt. Why is that? Because he was the Savior of the world. Then let's don't forget where we began today. We began today with people wanting to make Jesus a king. And we continue today by looking at Palm Sunday when they thought they had made him the king. See, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, this is what we call the triumphal entry, He was the rightful King to come into Jerusalem. What the people thought was not that they had recognized the rightful King. Does Jesus' entry into Jerusalem make Him King? Actually, what makes Him King? He's God, and He's the descendant, the promised seed of David. That's what makes Him King, right? Right? He's God, and He fulfills all the prophecies. That's what makes Him king. But now at this point, note, will you please, that the people thought they made Jesus their king. And when we see that they thought they made Him their king, we're seeing it along the lines of what they would have done in chapter 6 if Jesus hadn't hid Himself from them. In other words, He's their physical king, but He is not their spiritual king. When they cry, Hosanna, King of the Jews... They're not interested in an eternal king. They're not interested in a savior. They're interested in the kind of king that will get them out from under the thumb of the Roman government. Friend, here when we see the evidence that's given to us by the Apostle John and the inspiration of the Spirit, we're reminded that we need to examine what it is that we're thinking when we make Jesus our king. I'm not here today preaching lordship. I'm not preaching that if you don't make Jesus Lord, that that's the mean for salvation. If He isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. And all these catchy, unbiblical phrases that people have 
of making the gospel something other than looking to the cross of Jesus and receiving or believing in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is what saves. But there are many individuals that Jesus is a crutch. He fulfills the purpose or the need that He had. And these individuals would be fully happy for Jesus to come in and kick out Pilate and kick out uh, the governor and uh, tell Rome, we'll see you and if you want to come and be burned alive, you show up and do something about it. That's what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to come and to give them everything they wanted. Friend, God doesn't save you so He can give you all the things that you want that when you die won't matter anymore. I'm just reminded as we've been studying Ecclesiastes and finished up with our teenagers, one of the things that Solomon really, really emphasized was that anything under the sun is vanity. And what these people want with regard to king, a king is all vanity. It's all things that at the end of their life they wouldn't care a bit about. Listen to me, will you please? This past week, I've dealt with individuals who the circumstances this last week disrupted their life so much that the things which hitherto mattered the most don't make a bit of difference to them. And it could happen to you. Literally, events in your life could happen where the thing that you wake up thinking about, at the end of the day, you couldn't care less about and you'd say, don't talk to me about that. I don't care about that anymore. You know what those things are? They're anything about this life that you love more than you love Jesus. Listen, if this week anything's keeping you away from fellowship with Jesus Christ, you have the same attitude of people who would make Him their king. But by make Him their king, the idea is to make Him be what they want a king to be. And Jesus is who He is. You can't make Him anything. You see the contrast in the Scripture? You see the difference? Let's continue to read in our context then. Jesus in verse... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 17, the people therefore that was with Him when He called Lazarus out of the grave and raised Him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met Him, for that they, had, they heard that He had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye. Do you understand? Do you guys get how you prevail at nothing? Behold, the world has gone after Him. And all of a sudden, Jesus, being made the king, quote, that the people thought they had made him, thought that the whole world was gone after him. And what does that mean to the Pharisees? He's not the king we want. This isn't the king we want. This isn't whom we want to make our king. And let's, let's continue to read verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. This brings us, by the way, to the second part of our context. Or to, to really to the end of our message, I should say, just in case you're terrified right now. Uh, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Verse 21, the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. What wonderful lines those are, aren't they? Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them. Now notice the context. This is not the Greeks that Jesus is answering. It's Philip and Andrew who have been told by the Greeks that they want to see Jesus. The reason the Greeks wanted to see Jesus was because they heard of what He'd done. And they, they wanted to know Jesus. In verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now notice this. Jesus was not glorified at His triumphal entry into Jerusalem. <laughs> Jesus was glorified when He was lifted up on the cross and raised from the dead. In verse 24, Jesus said, My glorification is My death. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that means very, very true, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth more, much, forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth this life, his life in this world, shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Now it's a long, it's a long quote that Jesus has made, a long speech, and we're about to get to the crux of it. The Greeks have said, we want to see Jesus... Philip and Andrew have come and told Jesus, and Jesus said, now the hour has come for me to be glorified. And let me speak more plainly, unless a kernel of wheat fall on the ground and die, 
it can't bear more fruit. It doesn't grow. You can keep a kernel of wheat, you can keep it high and dry and safe, and as long as it is high and dry and safe, it will never produce anything. But when it goes into the ground and when it germinates, it does so because it, because it dies, because it's eaten up or consumed by the root that comes out of it. It grows into the plant that produces more wheat. We see this later on in the, the epistles, the illustration of death. And 1 Corinthians in particular, used as, Paul uses the same illustration that Jesus uses about death and about the fact that when we die physically, of course, then that's where, etern- that's where uh, the resurrection of the body comes from. It has to be planted into the ground. <coughs> Jesus is about to be planted, and He's going to be planted as a seed, which is going to spring up into life. Eternal life, new life. Now God's going to raise Him from the dead. But Jesus here is about to be glorified. The people think that He's glorified when He makes His triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But actually, Jesus is glorified. God is glorified when Jesus is lifted up on the cross. And here is the statement that Jesus made to God and God's confirming to the people. In verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. So can you imagine this? Here's Jesus looks up and says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said unto them, Notice this, because this is the message for us today. This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus said, God did not speak so that I could know that I'm His Son. Right? Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but the Son of Man which came down from heaven. Jesus knew where He came from. Jesus was there at the foundation of the world when He is the one who spoke the world into existence and formed it with His hands. Jesus wasn't in doubt about why He came. Jesus wasn't in doubt regarding who He was. But he said, this voice spoke from heaven, so you'd know who I am. And my friend, that voice is God's Spirit speaking today to you, so you'd know who He is. You cannot look at the evidence of the Scripture. You cannot look at the testimony of those who saw what Jesus did. And you cannot look at what God has done in the lives of believers and deny that Jesus is the Son of God who came to die for sin. But here Jesus is making a declaration. I did not come for you to make me a king. I came because I was a king to die to make you my children. And there's a difference. We'll finish our text and then we'll conclude here by reading the rest of it, shall we? Look down at verse 134. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? He said, oh, we heard in the law, Jesus, you're never going to die. And how is it? Well, no, Jesus is God's eternal Son. And He's going to give eternal life. But they weren't interested in eternal life. They are interested in temporary relief from Rome. And Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, notice this, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. And that's our conclusion today. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. And here we're reminded by Jesus Christ that you don't always have the opportunity to believe. Jesus is who He is, not who we make Him to be. Do you hear me today? Jesus is who He is, not who we make Him to be. People talk about, well, make Jesus their Savior. I hear Christians use this phrase, well, my God, or my Jesus, and they begin to describe things otherwise than the Bible says Jesus is. I've had people say, well, well, my Jesus would never judge anyone. My Jesus would never condemn anyone. My Jesus would never... Well, my friend, examine what the Bible says about Jesus. Examine what He says about Himself, because that's who He is, not who you make Him to be. 
And my friend, Jesus is your King, not who you make Him to be. He is the King. He is who He is, not who you perceive Him to be. And friend, you'll miss it while you have the chance to believe in Jesus, if you spend all your time not believing that He's who He says He is, but always believing that He's who you want Him to be, you'll miss it. You'll be just like individuals that Jesus is warning, now you have the light. Walk in the light. Now you have the truth. Believe the truth. Because you won't always have the opportunity. Now listen, you can say, Pastor, you're hard line. Uh, you know, this, this absolute... Bible authority thing is a little extreme for me. It's a little much for me. I, I don't accept that. I think that there are other ways. I think there are other means. I think that I think that God, you know, would understand. My friend, you can think a lot of things, but can I tell you something? Jesus is who He says He is. And why you can receive Him, you ought to. Because the day will come when Jesus said people will say, Lord, Lord, have not we done this in Your name? And have not we have not we, have not we. And you, you're all about Jesus. But He wasn't who He is. He was who you made Him to be. And there's a difference. I'm troubled. I'm troubled when I read articles about individuals like Mother Teresa. I don't hate Mother Teresa. I hope there's a chance somehow she believed in Jesus and, some, and that she's in heaven. But I don't think she is because she thought that good works were what God wanted. She thought that feeding the poor and living with the poor was the best thing instead of receiving Jesus. And that's at least what she taught. I hope she's in heaven. I hope she received Jesus. But my friend, there are a lot of people just like that, that this is who Jesus is. This is what God wants. Good deeds are who Jesus is. Now you miss it. You missed it. Jesus is the Son of God and He came to die for your sins to redeem you to God. And He's not who you've made Him to be or who anyone else has made Him to be, though there's great appeal. How many of us admire Mother Teresa as far as, humanly speaking, what she did? Well, I see her as a false teacher. But the things that she did, great. Those things don't get her eternal life. Those things don't make her a saint. When we could list person after person, that's just someone in our day that most people are familiar with. It's incredible to me that believers who know who Jesus is would promote Mother Teresa. We talk about her as though she's a, an example for the saints when she's turned so many people to believing in other Jesus than who He is. Jesus is warning those people that are standing before Him, many of whom five days later are going to be saying, Crucify Him! This day they've said, Hosanna in the highest. This day they've said, we would see Jesus. But just a few days later, they'll say, crucify Him. Because Jesus was not who they made Him to be. Friend, you can't make Jesus to be anything other than who He is. Can I say to you today that God is love more than you can understand? Can I say to you today from the Word of God that Jesus loves you beyond your comprehension, but He's who He is, not who you make Him to be. And you cannot even find enough people to concur around who Jesus should be to validate your opinion. It's true. You say, well, Jesus should be feeding the poor. That's what that's that's who Jesus is. He's a person who loved the poor. And anybody that loves the poor is believing in Jesus. Well, my friend, Jesus is other things as well. If you're gonna make him those things, you've got to make him other things. But you know who he is? He's he's the king of the Jews. Not because they made him their king, but because he was the rightful king. And not because he was going to do what they wanted him to do, but because he came to do what they needed him to do, and that is to die for their sins. Don't miss the message. Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die. That's why He went to Jerusalem. Jesus did not come to be a puppet, to do the whim of people. Jesus came to take care of the real need that they had, which is that they were condemned by God in their sin. And friend, that's the real need of every person Jesus was speaking to, isn't it? Do your good works. Do them as unto the Lord if you're a believer, and God will bless you for it. 
won't save you. And you can't make Jesus what you want Him to be. He's what you need Him to be, not what you want Him to be. I don't want to be silly or facetious in the wrong way. Brother Tony made a badge a few years ago. And if you knew Brother Chris, uh, who is an RN, some of the things that he did as a nurse, and you nurses here know some of the things nurses do, but uh, he made a badge and it was entitled Double Glove. It said Double Glove, and the caption was, Not the nurse you want, but the nurse you need. I won't tell you why. That's silly. But can I use the statement with Jesus in a not silly way? Jesus, King of the Jews. Not the king you want, but the king you need. And our need is sin. Not for us to be validated, not for us to feel like our way or our thought is right, but our need is that we need a Savior to die for our sin. And Jesus came to die. He perhaps wasn't the king they wanted, but He was the king they needed. And if you read further in John, you'll see that based on the message that Jesus here preached, people either received Him or rejected Him. And that's where you get to make Jesus your King, honestly. The fact is that Jesus is God, regardless of whether you acknowledge it or not. The fact is that God will judge every man in the world, whether they acknowledge Him or not. He is their God, whether they say, you know what, you're my God or whether they deny it. When the day of judgment, when the final judgment comes, they'll fall before God. And He is their God. But Jesus is your Savior. And you can accept Him as your Savior. You can receive Him. And then God will become your Father, not just your judge. And God, Jesus will become your friend and your brother. <clears throat> And then you'll have eternal life. And then all those things that people want God to do, God can do all those things. But our first need is a Savior. And that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus went into Jerusalem. While they're crying Hosanna, they're thinking, oh boy, now we're going to show Caesar. But Jesus is thinking, I'm going to the cross. Because that's who He is. And that's why He came. He's a Savior King, not just a temporary relief King. And that's who we need. And the question is, have you believed in Jesus? Have you received Jesus as your Savior? There's no other way. There's no other means. And Jesus isn't what you make Him to be. He's what He is. Father, God, I ask that Your Holy Spirit right now would just put Your finger on the heart's attitude of each individual in this room. Lord, I don't know hearts. My assumption is that every person here today has received Jesus as their Savior. But I cannot know what you know, and I cannot know what even the persons know who have made Jesus to be something other than a Savior who came to die for their sins. So Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just reveal the truth. You would just say in your words, you've made me your King, but He's your King. He's not who I am. Lord, I pray that you would just soften hard hearts. That individuals would receive Jesus. God, I pray this week, as the church has so many perceptions by so many people about who Jesus is and who believers are, that we would see that Jesus is the one who came to die for sin. That's what our King is. But He's not everything that we've made Him to be. With this truth, God, I pray that you would convict hearts and help people to believe, we pray. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I would ask for every person here to keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed. And the reason for that would be for the sake of privacy, both yours and the privacy of other people that are here as well. Uh, this could be one of the most important moments in your life or in someone else's. When I ask you the question this morning, is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? You might answer with a lot of answers that aren't honest or don't deal with the actual question. You might say, He's my King, but He's King of the Jews. He's not the person who died for your sin, the Son of God, who God glorified. 
If you never receive Jesus as your Savior, friend, you won't accidentally make it to heaven with your concept of what you've made Jesus to be. You'll stand before God and God will say, I never knew you because you didn't know Him for who He was. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor Price, don't embarrass me, don't call me out. But this morning, the Holy Spirit of God is convicting my heart and I'm concerned about the matter of who Jesus is to me. Maybe I've made Him something other than whom He is. And I see from the Word of God that Jesus came to die for sin, not to deliver people from poverty, not to just take care of problems of sicknesses. And God's showing me today that I need to receive Him as my Savior. Just slip your hand up. Just, just you and no one else looking around. Just slip your hand up. I wouldn't call you out or embarrass you. Just slip it right up and right back down. You hear this morning, you'd say, Pastor, you know, I agree with the Scripture. I always do. Anything God's Word teaches, I agree with it. But you know, in my mind, I've had a concept of Jesus and the reason that He came. And I have overcomplicated the work of the cross. I have added things to it. I've kept it from Jesus simply being the one who came to be crucified on the cross. I've made Christianity and being a follower of Jesus more than just the simple gospel. Today God showed me the importance because when I uh, am an example for unbelievers, I need to be clear about the gospel and why Jesus came. I don't want people to be confused that believers just do good works or feed the poor or uh, are, uh, do miracles. I want people to see the cross. And God's convicted me about the clarity of the gospel today. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Just say, God, show me some things about the clarity of the gospel. Just write back down. We're going to have a moment of invitation here this morning. We're going to sing softly and tenderly. And uh, we're going to finish our prayer first. God, I just ask that you would bless and move in the invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Before we begin singing, before our pianist begins to play, it's 246 if you'll begin to turn there in your blue hymn book. Before we begin to sing this morning, I want to just explain the invitation. The invitation is a time when we would invite you to feel free to respond to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. It might be about the matter of salvation. You say, Pastor, I need to be saved. Hey, you could just uh, motion to me during the service and Brother Andrew would take over the song. And I'll come to you and help you know how to have eternal life. We could deal with you uh, right outside or right out back or somewhere in a private way so that you could be confident you have eternal life. might be uh, that you that you just like someone to pray with you about something that God showed you in His Word. You just want to commit it to God with a witness. I'd be happy to do that for you in the time of invitation here this morning. It might be that God's spoken to you and He's been so clear that you know what He said and you just need to say, Yes, Lord. Well, don't leave this place without doing that because it would be no good for God to show you something if you don't respond to it uh, by obedience and by saying yes to Him. So that's the invitation this morning. Will you please stand and look to page 246. And while others are singing, if God's spoken to you, you do business with God. And then we'll dismiss after we're finished. Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. are passing. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Who are weary, 
Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Thank you so much for being here this morning. It's a very, very special day. It's the time of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But remember that Jesus didn't enter into Jerusalem to be made a king. Jesus entered Jerusalem because He was the king and He came to die. And let's think on those things and come back next week ready to celebrate the triumph of the resurrection. All right, I'm going to ask Andrew to dismiss us with a word of prayer. And after that, you're dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are just thankful for this opportunity to kind of look into Your Word. And Lord, we're just th we're thankful for the event for the events leading up to the cross, the events of your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But Lord, it help us always to reflect and remember why you came. You came not to be made a king, but but to be but to, to, to die for sin. Just Lord, we just thank you. We thank you again for allowing us to be in your house. We uh, pray uh, safety for all all of us traveling this afternoon, whether it be back to our houses or down to Miami Beach for worship there. And Lord, we do pray you bring us back tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.